Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I am joined by a plethora of special guests because we have above my head Ian C. Esselmont. Hello Cam. Hello, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, and of course, uh, Ian C. Esselmont is author of the novels of the Malazan Empire, the Path to Ascendancy novels, and has a forthcoming new novel that will be coming out relatively soon. So you know, that's one thing to talk about. We also are joined by Dr. Philip Chase, my nemesis. Hello, Philip. Hello, nemesis. How are you today? <laughs> I am I am good, Philip. It's it's good to see you. And last but obviously not least, uh, Stephen Erickson. Hello, Steve. Hi, hi. Pleased to be a plethora. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously this is this is a Malazan convergence of sorts. Uh, Philip and I obviously are doing our our read through of the uh, Malazan Book of the Fallen, and we're we're now up to Dust of Dreams and our read-through of the novels of the Malazan Empire, and we've just finished Blood and Bone. So I, I thought this would be a, a good opportunity for just to sit and have a chat about various things. And something came up, which uh, was a mistake on my part. I had suggested that Jakaruku, the name for Jakaruku, had maybe come from Frank Herbert's Dune. And I'm wrong. Wildly wrong. Wildly wrong. <laughs> uh, I, I no. apologize to you, gentlemen. Because <laughs> Jakarutu doesn't sound anything like Jakaruku. <laughs> yes, that, that T and K aren't interchangeable <laughs> at all. Mm -hmm. uh, but this, this was an interesting point about where, how you, how you both came up with like various names and, and the structures of things. And um, so Cameron, you, you had mentioned that you're not responsible for the majority of the names, are you? <laughs> I was just nice trying to absolve myself of any guilt. <laughs> uh, no, you, you had asked if we had uh, gamed in, in, in Jakaruku, and actually we hadn't. Uh, no. We didn't do that. Uh, and, and so um, I, in that case, Steve or I, are, we have a, a pretty free hand to uh, sketch in the details. Um, yeah. Uh, we gained in a sale, though, didn't we? Yeah, I think we did briefly. Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, it, it, if you never gamed in Jakaruku and Himitan, was it always going to be a jungle setting? Mm, that's a good question. I don't think it was predestined to be a jungle setting. Uh, I, I, I don't think that's the case. Uh, no. From my uh, thinking back, I, it was pretty much open and I could uh, do what I wanted there. Uh, within, of course, the, the lineages of, of what we were trying to achieve. Yeah, and I, and I would think, you know, one of, the, one of the advantages of leaving these things open is that you can take your life experience, you know, post-gaming and apply it to uh, whatever it is you're writing and the settings you're creating. So, you know, your journeys through Central America and then um, Cambodia and places like that, uh, you know, that's what informs, you know, a lot of the, the description. So, it makes sense that uh, it should be open. Uh, you can, you know, you're free to do this. Yeah. You did, you did kind of go for it there too, didn't you? Because you've got a jungle on one half of the continent, you've got a desert on the other and a spine of mountains in between. And you've got these humongous ice fields surrounding that continent. All, a lot of this is happening through magic, I'm assuming, right? The jaggets and Omtos Flak and all that sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a, a very scarred, uh, continent with a, uh, a very deep history and these are all the remnants of <clears throat> they're sort of hanging around from earlier ages uh and so it yeah i mean you can critique the spine of mountains but it's, it's not that great it's more of a karst topography it's uh this actually very eroded very uh, uh sort of the remnants of, of an ancient mountain range huh and there's a legacy of, of color there as well, right? That's that, underneath all of this, right? I mean, that, that obviously had some impact on what we see in the, in the present, I would assume. I, this is something we could actually uh, maybe talk about to, to Steve in our peril, uh, because for me, I saw much of color's legacy in, in Jakaruku. Uh, and the um, pre 
pre prelude preface that you spoke about in Memories of Ice. Yes, yes. That's the only other time we see Jakaruku uh, in, in the Wise Book of the Fallen. Yeah. <clears throat> for me, um, while they weren't necessarily in a physical region when they were meeting, uh, it, for me, uh, it was referring uh, to Jakaruku. And I don't know if that's the case in Steve's mind. Though. I don't know if that's the case either. Um, but probably, probably Jakaruku. But again, you know, if it's just going to be something like a prologue, I'm not going to sort of nail down, you know, the setting to, to any great degree, right? Because, yeah. you know, it's a brief appearance and it's, the setting was not that relevant to, you know, to what was going on with, with the prologue, as far as and I can recall. And it was a pretty bad fans day. have just had their hearts broken by that. How so? <laughs> But what was inter what's interesting about that prologue though is that prologue is very much written as mythic. It it you, that de uh, destabilized notion of truth because the idea of the three gods walking up and Kalor sitting on a throne of bones is much more mythic and symbolic rather than literally they they wandered up and went hi. <laughs> How long did it take you to make that throne of bones? Were you there all day? It's a lot of symbolic rendering rather than uh, uh, photorealistic or uh, filmic uh, truth. Yeah, and, and my primary sense of Kalor uh, with that prologue came from the fact that I had read uh, Return of the Crimson Guard, an early version of it, uh, long before then. So that's sort of, that's, that was my sense of Kalor that I took and stuck into that scene. So blame Cam, you know. <laughs> yeah, so the he was, we played him a lot. I played him a lot more. Yeah. I mean, we saw much more of Caller in the gaming. Yeah. Uh, he was a recurring uh, nemesis. To use it. Was he an NPC or a, a player yeah. character? He was an NPC, I think. Was, yeah. he, was he an NPC, Steve? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Most, mostly NPC. Uh, and... Um, he had a lot more uh, discussions with the main characters and and uh, but we don't and we saw more of that in an, in the earlier return of the crimson guard but then it got cut out oh did it <clears throat> right Mo well, well, most right. not yeah. all because uh, obviously like I, I have a recurring thing at the minute that i, I quite enjoyed saying like, hashtag color did nothing wrong <laughs> Well, now I'm wondering if you're actually right about that, AP, because when the three elder gods show up, they, he seems to be getting the blame for the uh, the state of the place. It's a bit of a mess, right? Uh, <laughs> and all the people are dead and gone. And he said, you're too late, haha. -ha. Uh, so that narrative might not be um, quite authentic, I guess. Uh, and the, the, the Coral, of course, was the where the uh, crippled god came down. The impact was, was there, right? The sister continent. Sure. If I right. may, it, these shards fell everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. right. Not just in, in the fist and uh, coral, but all, right. all across the planet, there were uh, impacts. Right. Uh, right. So just to clarify. Yeah. That, and that is what AP said earlier, too. It's like you're not going to have just, it's going to fragment and it's going to make a mess in all kinds of places. Uh, so I, I guess I'm asking, and you don't have to answer, but um, is that what? That's what caused the demise of Collar's empire. Then, uh, not Collar himself, but he gets the blame for it later on. And, and is that kind of what's going on there? Well, we've just read Blood and Bone. Yeah, that, which you know, that's the implication in Blood and Bone. It's the thaumaturgs called down the crippled god. Right. That's right. Unless, unless either of these two gentlemen want to now disprove me in a video and I will edit out that section so I still look <laughs> like I'm right. <laughs> the balls in, in Steve's court here, he has um, said he had plans for Kalor. Uh -huh. Um, Plans. Only in the Carcanus trilogy, I think. Um, where he's shouldering his way into the story. Um, and, you know, I, I'm fighting it all the way, but um, he's sort of insisting on being there. So, ah. so that's in Walk in Shadow. And that may well have an impact on the interpretations and the scenes that have been seen so far in both my books uh, and Cam's. Um, 
And that it's one of those instances where I take a lot of pleasure in completely messing up with Cam Cam's sense of <laughs> So it's a it's a case of, of um, that's what that's what can fire me up is um, you know just to blindside Cam on this one. I'll, I'll flip it. Don't you worry. I'll flip I know it. you will. I know, and that's just it because yeah, you're 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 amazing at, at flipping these things. So. You see, uh, this this is giving us insight into how your gaming went. It's like someone, I have this carefully crafted narrative. What did you do with what I, oh, I hate you. There's a lot of pranking that seems to be oh, going yeah. on here. I, I actually heard something about an inflatable unicorn in regard to a prank as well. I thought that was a, that, that unicorn appeared once even on a critical dragon, I believe, right? Yeah, I think that that's, that's ICPA related. <laughs> That, that had nothing to do with Cam. No. That's he's, nothing to do with me. He's innocent I on this I involved myself of, of, of that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Can we maybe focus on some sort of vaguely related oh, oh, Malazan oh. thing? <laughs> are there any inflatable unicorns in the Malazan series? There are unicorns and rainbows. <laughs> I, I, where are the unicorns in Malazan? Mm. You just haven't been reading carefully enough, AP. Yeah. The closest you get to a unicorn are the jag horses. And they don't have a horn on their head. Well, we're it, not talking. Well, it's, it's, it's now suddenly I'm going to go, the, in, in, in the next book, this unicorn strides into the... <laughs> ha, 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 AP. <laughs> yeah, not, not too many fantastic beasts. Um... Even at the very beginning when we were gaming, um, there were dragons, but I was reluctant to introduce them in, in the, the, the written books. Uh, and so I, I, was, I was really debating whether or not to, to because it's such a, a stereotype of, of, of the genre, I was resisting it. Um, but in the gaming, it was, you know, there were it's definite, <clears throat> uh, shape shifting into dragons and, and all the rest yeah actually now that you mentioned it it does it is interesting there are very few sort of fantasy creatures in the malazan world like you, you have the the elite the the dragons um and you have the denrabi um if that's probably mispronounced but for for the most part, there, there aren't that many sort of fantastical creatures like manticores and and the the things that you know we, we would find in D and D and Forgotten Realms and uh, a lot of the the RPGs. Hmm. And and humans or humanity is are, are is the main race. Um, I mean, there are these other races, but they are um, a fading. A uh, they are they have a, a more a more limited presence in the world that's the humanity is the main main race uh so you don't have the sort of typical fantasy di division of the dwarves in the mountains and the elves in the woods and that sort of thing well it's interesting too because you have the imas who are not human but perhaps in some way or form ancestral to humans ancient, and it's ancient ancient yeah so it's a little bit like of course you're both you have both have this anthropological background and we used to think that neanderthals for example had nothing to do with with homo sapiens sapiens right and and of course in recent years we found that uh, we have some of us are running around with some neanderthal genes in us you know um so i wonder how much of that came into play as you were you know making uh the the emas and and deciding how they're relating to uh the other races in, in the story. Um, go ahead, Ken. Oh, well, oh, yes, but uh, I don't think we can go too much further here uh, as uh, a sale is next. So. Yeah. Oh, oh, <laughs> which I need to read. Yeah. OK. <laughs> but actually, weird quote, didn't you do a lot of gaming at sort of like the Bronze Age of Malazan? Mm. Not a lot, but we oh. did. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember that, Ken? Uh, iron was was relatively rare. Uh, and yeah, most of the weapons and armor was uh, bronze. It was sort of a classical Greek city-state uh, 
period. Um, but it, it wasn't fixed and, and there was, you know, these things aren't delineated so, so narrowly. And so there were certain uh, areas that where iron was more abundant and, and more common. Yeah, but, so I remember drawing the, the Iron Age map. I still have it kicking around for Quantali um, with, you know, different coast different uh, coastal expression because sea levels were different. So um, I remember I always liked doing that kind of map where, where you can sort of morph things and um, shift them around. But I, I, I seem to recall that that game involved Kellen Van and Dancer actually time traveling or something along those lines and, and slipping oh. back into the, into the Bronze Age um, mm. in, their, in their journeys. Because they, this is spoilers, I guess, but they had already found their way into the dead house and were already traveling uh, through all the warrens. And um, so I remember doing the map and then plopping, you know, uh, running a game where Dancer was my NPC. So I guess it would have been Wu, uh, dropping them into the, uh, into the Bronze Age. I don't know how, I don't know how much of a campaign it was, Hmm. Doing then they probably screwed it up and then you know he got failed. I remember much of that. Uh, <laughs> no, what what I recall, it's like we're recalling each other's stuff. I I recall your campaign set in the future after in Stratum after the Crimson Guard had become legendary, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what I I remember. Wow, you guys have like hundreds of books waiting to be written here, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> Where does the Bronze Age fit also in chronologically, and, and maybe that's a dumb question, but it's somewhere between Carcanus and the last Book of the Fallen, I oh, guess. Oh, yeah. It comes yeah. just before the Iron Age. Well, yes, we know this. <laughs> <laughs> Very helpful. Very yeah. helpful. Yeah. Yeah, but you guys have hundreds of stories that you could be writing in this world, don't you? Well... You know, we're we're so far being moved by by theme, and and that's so we have to. That's what we're pursuing, and uh, you, I, I personally, I have to feel that quickening, that that uh, like so, oh, I can do something here, and then that region or that period uh, becomes worthy of attention. And, yeah, yeah. And, uh, from from some of the stuff that that you guys have told me, like I mean, there were there are vast patches of the the history of Malazan that weren't game that was like you were gaming over here and stuff was still happening over there because you had like elements of the Crimson Guard were posted somewhere and they were just hanging around there for a while because wasn't one of them constructing a a very secure fortress um yeah, they, they weren't Crimson Guard oh who was no, that they, they were they were outliers um that and that was um actually what three three holdover characters from one of your uh games cam uh, with your friends. So oh, I'm thinking Shal Morzin, um, that area, uh, west of Seven Cities. Hmm. You don't remember any of this, do you? No. Nope. Wasn't, wasn't there a big keep or something? Said, the the yeah. walls that they decided to reinforce the walls and the wall, you, they kept making the walls thicker and thicker and thicker. It wasn't <laughs> That sounds like something we might do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh no, no. I know what you're thinking, uh, AP. Um, you're thinking Tower Thick. Does that ring a bell, Cam? Oh, aptly named Tower Thick. Yeah. Tower <laughs> Thick. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, would you care to explain this? Because obviously, I've misremembered something. It was built in Stratum um, by Blues, because um, he was using Earth Magics at the time. I think I'm pretty sure, and it was occupied by Fingers. Blues, um, Skinner, Shimmer, and who's the third person or the next person? I don't know. That squad, anyways. That squad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, by this point, at least in the games, um, Fingers had acquired sort of permanent flight, and so he he he'd float two or three feet above the floor uh, with his legs crossed and. By this point, he his legs had atrophied to the point where he couldn't walk anymore, right? So, um, yeah, but that was blues for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. tower thick. Yeah, yeah. And I, got, I have a drawing of that somewhere, actually. They were all um, very uh, 
envious, secretly envious of, of Jorik. Um, at the yeah, end. yeah. Uh, Jorik Sharp Lance, uh, who was a hero. And everywhere he went, he was the hero. And no matter what they did, and they, they were always relegated to the background. <laughs> All the time. And, and Jorik was one of, yeah, one of the characters I rolled up with, you know, the stupidest name imaginable. And and played him in such a fashion that, yeah, he was the center of the universe wherever he went. Yeah. <laughs> and then Cam, of course, takes that and makes him the center of the universe wherever he goes. Right? <laughs> uh, he, he could not help but win. I mean, yeah. He not <laughs> fail to win. Yeah. 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 Okay. This is, anytime I hear like you talk about a lot of these games, there's a level of absurdism to, mm -hmm. to what you did in the gaming that doesn't translate really that much into the fiction like it's a very distinct tonal shift now, obviously there's some elements of it creep in and it's and this is why it, as often as we talk about it evolving from the game world the the fiction is a lot more serious and a lot more literary and it, it's doing a lot more complicated things than simply being a rendering of the game and what happened in the game that the games were very distinct and i think they perhaps it was, were a springboard for some of the stories that you wanted to tell rather than this being, Oh, do you remember that game? I'll just write down what happened. And that's my novel. Yeah, no, no, we didn't do that. I mean, Jorik is mentioned in gardens of the moon. <clears throat> yeah. By his full name, Jorik Sharplands. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Brood's complaining about him. Um, yeah. And we might see him in, in the third book that, of the series I'm working on. Oh, yeah? Cool. In, in Northern <laughs> Ginnabacus. Cool. Oh, yeah, they, name a lake, they name a lake after him somewhere or other, right? In, yeah, in, yeah. Is that, that's mentioned in Blood and Bone, I think. They, and uh, it's Shimmer who's not happy about them naming a lake after him. <laughs> yeah, because no, they, don't, they hate him. <laughs> they hate him. Yeah, they all hate him. <laughs> Except Kaz, I guess. Kaz was okay with naming the lake after him. He doesn't, he doesn't mind someone who can bring, sh you know, shine and, and glory to the guard. <laughs> okay. See, I, this, is the, this is an Easter egg that only the two of you knew about. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's, there's so many. I mean, it's... <laughs> but I feel like Because we're just joking. We're, we're, I'm, yeah. Steve and I, and I are playing little... Um, little jokes for each other. See, now I have become convinced that all of this publishing of Malazan novels is nothing more than a long-running gag between the two of you. The books <laughs> are entirely incidental to the two of you trying to wind each other up and make each other laugh. That's very true. <laughs> it's very true. I feel like the spirit of the gaming might come through the most, maybe in the Bocalane and Corbel Brooch novellas. Is that there's a sort of a absurdist element there? I guess I don't know. Or there's it, there's certainly more uh, directly humorous, I guess, or mo a lot of the time. I don't know. Do you think that that's the case? No, I, I no, no, I don't think so. Um, it's hard to hard to figure out where where sort of the spirit of the I think the spirit of the games comes through in the interaction of various characters and their attitudes towards each other towards each other mm -hmm. um so it's kind of a a, a wary rivalry uh, uh between a lot of characters and uh you know uh, the way Cam has has sort of explored Dancer and uh and Wu Kelamed I think it, it really matches uh, a lot of the, the, the spirit of the games um, to a large extent. So the banter, yeah. Yeah. So it's lying in, in, in the banter. And then the, the love and regard the coming through in, in between the, the various characters. And yeah, and, and the acts of frustration as well, right? Characters getting frustrated with each other. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we would play off of that a lot. And that's why Jorik was such was such fun to play because, you know, I was I I think I had all those other characters as as um, written up characters, so I'd have to sort of switch hats when it came to Jorik, and he would get all pompous and and make his speeches and all the rest, and everybody else would be rolling their eyes, right? So, uh, and and so there'd there'd be always that kind of frustration and, and sparks that would fly uh, between characters. Um, 
and especially if Cam, you know, if Cam's got these these NPCs that are driving me crazy, like you know, Osric or Calor or something like that, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's just that was part of it. And so if I'm being driven crazy, then the characters have to be driven crazy in the books. <laughs> so because, because certainly um Cameron's books depict the Leos a little bit differently than than you do, Steve. Yeah, well, I, I got I got burned early on by 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 Lore, um Osric. Um as my my first point of contact uh, when I was playing Anamanda Rake, and he just uh, Osric just drove me up the freaking wall, and um, so that probably that probably clouded my my views of the Leosin uh, forevermore. <laughs> and yet, it's you who are exploring them more much more than I. I know, I know, it's not yeah. weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, because. With uh, one of the, the last books that we read in the Malazan Book of the Fallen was obviously um, uh, Told the Hounds, which has a, a strong element of crop in it. And, you know, when, when Philip and I were reading Orb, Scepter, Throne, and again, crop is there. And yeah. there are differences in the, in the two of you and how the two of you approach crop. But it, it, there is something uh, there of, yes, it is exactly the same character. But I can imagine it's it's that external perspective that one of you had, and then the internal perspective. Uh, so Cam, I think you it was Steve's character, so you saw him externally, whereas Steve knew him internally. Um, yeah, Krupp was was um, <clears throat> Steve's character, and uh, and in the game, he's he's exactly the same as he is in the books. <laughs> it was it was wonderful. Uh, Krupp is a great character. I think I even had a bandana that would pat my head every time he started. Oh, when we were gaming, he pat he pat his head. Yeah, and of course, one of the things Krupp would do, and of course, I would tell Cam, "I'm doing this." Um, yeah, he said, "Krupp does this." <laughs> no, 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 not just that. But I would say, I, I cast a spell, uh, an illusion spell that makes me start sweating profusely, right? <laughs> Usually, when I'm talking to Baruch or somebody. And so I'd have all this sweat pouring down, and that would just be part of the part of the scene itself that, that was built up. So it's it's weird. I mean, I, I think illusion magic in gaming is highly underutilized, but you know, by most gamers, um, you can use illusion for um, comedic effect, and it's in world comedic effect as opposed to just the external stuff. So yeah, I would have. Um, yeah, crap, sweating profusely whenever he was sort of under the gun or perceived himself as, you know, uh, in, in a, a difficult situation he had to talk himself out of. Uh, he would just, the sweat would just start pouring down. So, yeah. and, and of course, um, Wu or um, Kelvin was, was a, an illusionist and all, all his power uh, was an illusion. <laughs> <laughs> even, even his appearance. Yeah, even his appearance is an illusion. Uh, he was a, a complete fraud. Uh, <laughs> because in the books, you're never really quite sure, I feel like. And in Past to Ascendancy, even, there's this sense of, is this guy for real? Or is he just completely BSing his way through all this? Right? Yeah. yeah. I think the answer to that is yes. He is either for real or BSing his way through, <laughs> or both at the same time. Like it's well, he does, he comes into power a certain amount of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, huh. yeah. A lot of bluffing to begin with, though, especially on Malaya's Island. I seem to recall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when when you were you were coming up, obviously with the, the various campaign and story threads and stuff, like. I, like Cam, you've you've talked before about how elements of what happened in Gardens of the Moon in, in Darugistan was, uh, you know, it was that was your storyline for that campaign, and a lot of it was influenced by the Three Musketeers. It, it's like, were there were there any other sort of famous famous? Was it the books or the film? Uh, the book, um, <clears throat> the books. Uh, uh, the, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was a, a kernel. It was a, a, a beginning point. Uh, and and I, so I had um, this 
city with um, these uh, three friends who are hanging out and, and um, it wasn't a programmatic, you know, this is Athos, this is Portos, but there's a, there are elements of that, like Murillo is very much uh, a, a, the, the fancy um, ladies man of, of the Three Musketeers. I forget which, I forget which one that was. Um, Aramis. Aram, it was Aramis, so he's much more the Aramis figure. Uh, and um, when it, when we wrote the screenplay, there was no um, D'Artagnan. There was no Crocus. Uh, yeah, Crocus. There was no Crocus D'Artagnan figure. No youth. Uh, and, but <clears throat> when we pitched it, uh, what came back to us was, well, you need to have a vehicle for a main character for the, rear, the viewers to follow. So you have to have someone, you have to introduce someone. Uh, and, and yes, so we went back and mulled that over. <laughs> we were not happy. <laughs> mm. Yeah, but then we created Crocus for that, so. And then we, you know, proceeded to undermine the trope, uh, you know, at every turn. So. <laughs> mm. Yeah, made every effort. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's it, 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 pitching the, the screenplays. We, we met with a lot more resistance. I, actually, maybe Steve won't agree. Maybe he met with Steve with, with a lot of resistance trying to pitch the books. Uh, they they were not what people were used to. It, you know, right? No, 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 no. I was basically told uh, by the American publishers that, in effect. Um, the books were too sophisticated for an American audience. It well, just That's very flattering. Isn't it? And, and these, <laughs> these are, you know, American publishers. So, you know, it's like... Speaking as know, the American here, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, thankfully, that has been disproven. <laughs> completely disproven. Yeah, completely disproven. I, I think so. Yeah. 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 Well, so it, it, was, it was a case, you know, of... of constantly running up against, you know, these, these walls thrown up um, and then having to recover and, and convince oneself that, no, you know, they're, they're wrong in this. And, and I just have to keep pushing. And we just have to keep pushing until mm -hmm. eventually um, we'll knock down the wall and see what happens. And, you know, it, it's a gamble because maybe they weren't wrong. And in which case, you know, there'd be no malazan books out there now. So, um, it was just constantly fighting on that. And too many characters, obviously, um, being dropped into the story, sink or swim kind of thing was, was not common. Um, it was not common. The, the ensemble brooch wasn't yeah. it was considered too confusing. The, the readers wouldn't have one particular hero to follow. And, yeah. and, that, and if you didn't do that, that's poison. The book won't, won't sell. Yeah, and, and you know, I think Willow was coming out came out around that time too and we were and so the whole notion of fantasy as as your your classic good versus evil um you know gardens of the moon the script just tore that to pieces because we had both sides um and they were both sympathetic at, at various times mm. so um yeah we we're running you know swimming against the tide there for sure and you know in that respect we failed utterly right we never told the script and it's, it's <laughs> and then and then we did um um black dog blues which i think is actually probably a, a better story um huh. but there we were messing around with the clan of mass with tool and mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the um and the squads um in the camp more of a military uh, yeah band. very much so but comedic as well right so huh. very much so but was black dog blues was that the um uh, the campaign uh, which which campaign was Mott, that, that was Mott and uh <clears throat> northern guinebacus yeah yeah um so stump fit would have uh been been appropriate for that discussion uh mentioned um probably just as the the modern regulars god but i think we we, we created a whole story uh for the script that wasn't gained yeah and um it would have it would have really shifted the i think the the whole talana mass storyline 
um, it would have shifted it away from what we had uh, in in the in the script because there was a strong comedic element to and but also a completely insane element. Um, if you recall, Cam, I think that the main premise was Tool joins Whiskey Jack's squad and um, announce, or he gets a sense that there's a Jagu hiding in, in the swamp in, in Mott Wood or something. That makes sense. And yeah, and then he just becomes relentless and he drags the squad with him into the swamp and, and all they, hell breaks loose. And I don't know if the bulls were there at that time. I'm not sure. I don't think so. I don't no. think they were, but that's the spirit and that's <laughs> yeah. of what we were encountering. Yeah. 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 It was going to be complete mayhem. Yeah. Yeah, it's because anytime I read about the moda regulars or uh, any of those characters, like they're just they're so insane that and th this is something about the Malazan world in general, that there's insanity in the in the Malazan world. And yet, for some bizarre reason, you both make it fit that it doesn't seem out of place. Dinosaurs with swords for arms are absurd and ridiculous. And yet it works like i don't i don't understand how you managed to do that <laughs> yeah i don't know uh i mean in terms of you know insanity um obviously it's a relative term but if you if you if you study anthropology and, and so you're studying um the multitude of cultures that have been you know ethnographically recorded world over um many cultures don't treat unusual members uh in the same fashion that we do mm. so in other words quite often your 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 quote loony bin um is actually revered uh because they're they are closer to the spirit world um they don't have that um, that barrier between them and and that spirit world and that and, you know and that's the case for for uh, neurological disorders for schizophrenia and all these things um so if you think of that attitude and then just sort of spread it across the entire world um people being you know not normal uh it's not necessarily a, a bad thing and you know that that is very much a, a it's a modern stigma that, and a Western stigma um, that is more obsessed with um, conformity and, and uh, physical perfections and all the rest and, and all of those things. And so the Malaysian world is, is the opposite of that. It, it's, it's tipping the hat to all of those, you know, all of those cultures world over um, that have a very different attitude towards um, people who are slightly unusual. And, you know, there, there may have been a slight self-reflection there because Cam and I were, you know, at, in, in university, <laughs> supposedly doing a writing program and spending all of our time sitting in, in you know, in our, our, our flat gaming, you know, gaming ridiculous stuff, like a couple of geeks went back when geeks weren't, you know, cool. Like we are now. Also, yeah. <laughs> also, um, we hope that the world is a bit more pagan in, yeah. in approach to things. And that goes, that's in line with what we're talking about. And for example, Dionysus is a god of, of insanity uh, and, and, and fits and seizures and uh, wild passions. So there, you know, that's a world that's um, pre-Christian, pre uh, pre-Judeo-Christian -Jude tradition. Uh, uh, we hope, you know, we, we can't claim to be able to say it is, but we're trying to portray a more pagan view of the world. Yeah, which I think is a lot more forgiving um yeah. in many ways uh forgiving of the uniqueness of individuals um and so that you know that that's definitely an undercurrent that runs through this so we have characters who deal with other characters who are not you know not quite all there and they don't have a problem with it generally you know yeah. they just they just deal with them it's actually pretty tough to say who's the most lovably eccentric. You've got sappers, you've got mages. My favorite might be the Jagat, actually, <laughs> uh, who are, 
I, I, their humor is what always makes me enjoy my time with the jagged. Uh, so, um, and it's just they're this strange combination, strange from our perspective of uh, complete loners. I guess is is that's part of it too. I think that's part of their eccentricity. Uh, so yeah, that's a lot of yeah. fun. Yeah, I think I think they really they're a continuation of something that happened in the gaming uh, on Malaz um, Island, and the first person, the character, the character that comes to mind is the NPC character called Obo, ah, which, um, yeah, we have not seen of, much of him, but, uh, yeah. no, you sure don't. Right. Because every time somebody needed help and went and knocked on his door, he would open the door. You, you'd lay out your problem and he'd slam the door in your face. <laughs> and that's the last <laughs> we saw of Obo. Right. We just he's kept in, night, he's in night of knives, right? Yeah. yeah. It's a running joke. Uh, yeah, he's a, the, the great and powerful Obo. Yeah. <laughs> With his, he lives in a tower, and yeah. is that, that's supposed to be a sort of an echo, or that's the beginning of the jagged tower, perhaps. Or? It may, it may have had yeah. some influence, just uh, subconsciously. But Oba was so much fun to um, to have in the games because, you know, he would be, you know, he'd be. I mean, it's a play on Obi Wan, right? You know, you're you're my only hope, and so the character would go to the tower, <laughs> out on the door. And he'd open the door and he'd scowl at you and you'd talk away and then he'd just slam the door. And that would be it. <laughs> Gotta move away and find your help somewhere else. And I, I have to assume this is like Lucy holding the football for Charlie Brown. Was there yeah. an, an implication every time that maybe just this once yeah. Obo would help you? <laughs> no, well, I, I got him out of the tower. I mean, I you did. did. You did yeah. 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 Eventually. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's, um, but just one last addition to the um, insanity thing, I might just have to kick it in. I mean, we've all read Catch-22. We all know war is insane. Yeah. Uh, it, it, as a practice, you, you, you are wasting all of this treasure and resources and human lives mm -hmm. for what? And so war itself is, is uh, insane. And I hope that comes across. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I, I'm, I might have to think now about uh, a lot of the the battle or the, the, the soldiers in the banter in terms of reframing it with Catch-22 because I hadn't thought of looking at it with that lens and mm -hmm. uh, like Heller's work obviously will that actually be really interesting I might have to have a think about that mm -hmm. yeah very very influential but you could see how Heller's work also influenced people like Gustav Hasford and the short timers and things like mm -hmm. that so um just the, the the madness and the insanity of, of and then the the necessary response to that madness which is that that sort of droll um irony uh and and acceptance of the absurdity of situations um and i think we have that a lot in the books especially with the with the soldiers but when you were gaming, it wasn't a, uh, how much of the, actually, was the gaming military based? Because you were saying about the power of illusion magic and why it's so often overlooked. And one of the reasons obviously is when we think of spells in combat, particularly like in, in D and D systems and RPG systems, you know, the, the illusion of a fireball or, <clears throat> well, why don't I just cast <clears throat> a fireball that it, the, the idea of magic having a direct effect is is much easier to wrap your head around and you think of it solely as a tool to to cause damage in fights but a, a lot of what you're talking about in terms of gaming was not about conflict it was about um playing in the world mm -hmm. yeah <clears throat> i mean the thing is uh in most of those game systems um full use of illusion can break the system yeah it can break the game mm. um and so one has to be careful on those things as well. So, I mean, I think a lot of the, the illusion stuff that we were doing in our gaming was not just for comedic effect, but it was, it was uh, situational, it, it was um, atmospheric, it was uh, for laughs. Um, and, and basically to add to elements of, of the character's own sense of absurdity. You know, one of, I think the first game, the first night actually, when I ran when Cam rolled up Wu and I, I had Dancer as the NPC, that first game, um, how much did you use of that in, in um, your, your opening book and pass? 
Cam. Do you remember? Because they get into they get into that old wizard's tower and there's just a, a whole keystone cop kind of scenario where they're dealing with uh, i think it's twist this is the game stuff was and that the first was that the very that was, that was the very first really? yeah it yeah. was okay well then mechanics just went out the window like, yeah they did like we did yeah. not like all the game mechanics the careful balancing that goes into structuring these games uh it just went out right out the window and we did not pay any attention to that at all no we just, we just riffed um yeah um i remember that uh we were uh tasked or we just stumbled upon this um wizard's lair as we were told it was uh and went in uh to steal whatever the he had or she or whoever and what we didn't know was that what we had encountered was his pet uh, uh twist and he just led us on this merry chase. Yeah, the wizard was dead. He died of yeah, old the wizard was, wasn't even there, or whatever. And he yeah. just made you know made fun of our uh, aspirations and and, <laughs> and tricked us repeatedly. And oh, I was responding yeah. uh, with my trickery, even though I shouldn't have been able to because you only get a certain number of spells. But never mind. <laughs> well, and, and also, I, what I recall is, yeah, I think you were really thrown for a loop because, you know, he would. Twist would show up as, as this giant demon. And, um, you know, half the time you're trying to fight it and the other half you're running away. And then he would show up in, in closets. You know, you'd open a closet and he's standing there. So, you know, he was doing the impossible over and over again. Uh, so it really did become sort of Keystone Cops in that, in that down the corridors and in all the rooms, and, uh, his head popping out of the stove and, you know, Twist was just having a blast with him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it took a while for you to sort of, for it to click that, that mm -hmm. yeah, you, what you were dealing with was a, a little a little demon that happens to be an illusionist. Huh. Yeah. yeah, you have two different warrens for illusions, don't you? You have Makra and, and Mianas, or Mi Mianas, is that how you say it? Um, I've always said it Mianas, but. Mianas, okay, so Mianas and Makra. Is it principal difference that Mianas is, is shadow-based or, or, or am I misremembering that? It's more shadow-based, okay. uh, but it has to do with uh, deception and uh, trickery. Uh -huh. So that overlaps with uh, the mental aspects. With Makra. Yeah. Huh, yeah. okay. Yeah. At least in our <laughs> yeah perception of, of the mechanics, which right. uh, I understand may may or may not line up uh, completely, but but you have nailed down tight, and we can completely rely <laughs> on any, any explanation that you might give right now. <laughs> and I'm sure there's a stone tablet somewhere that all of the rules were etched into, so that they would be forever fixed. Absolutely, yeah. yes. It's just we've mislaid it. Yeah, it's around here somewhere. It's somewhere, somewhere. <laughs> you lost your stone tablets. Yeah, I'm afraid so. Yeah, <laughs> but it's all there. It's just... sure. <laughs> yeah. No, it's because I, I am one of the things that I always get curious about are you know where uh, various influences, and I know like it's easy for people like me always to focus on literary influences, but filmic influences um quite often are are there um so that that's why I, I was curious about that aspect um well yeah i mean we had this huge black and white tv um with a vcr and i do remember uh the three musketeers the um the george mcdonald fraser scripted one and we certainly had that we had um a number of classic sort of films. Um, Line and Winter, I think, was our main inspiration for sitting down and, and actually scripting stuff. Um, unless my memory's wrong on that, Cam, I don't know. But yeah, I don't recall. No. Uh, uh, other than just growing up and going to the movie theaters and and having that uh, internal uh, list of of uh, favorite films from growing up. Uh, that's that's what I see, th can think of as a, as an influence. Well, I remember we watched um, Long Hot Summer, which you know created uh, Ben Quick, Quick Ben. Hmm. 
you don't remember those i yeah. had all these black and whites um to have and to have not um treasure of sierra madre um yeah we were watching a lot of that stuff you guys realize that you are living illustrations of that theme you have in your books where somebody remembers one thing and another remembers another half of the story <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Sometimes they don't line up, and uh, but that's yeah. just to be expected. It's... Huh. Well, okay, I have I have one last question, which is um, with the the game world and like a lot of the gaming that you were doing, and then we look at the a lot of the concepts that both of you explore in the fiction. So things about the impact of the past uh, on the present the um a lot of the egalitarian movements and um gender politics and uh imperialism colonialism and uh undercutting a lot of like say the great man of history theories a lot of those elements that play such important roles in the fiction but how much how much of that was with the gaming because the gaming while you were designing this world i mean so much of it was for fun it was like you playing around like how much were you feeding in a lot of those very serious notions into the game world wow i mean well kelenved is is us making fun of of the great man of history right because you know he's 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 so shadowy that he has no substance right and then George Sharplance is the same thing, you know, the great man of history in his own mind. Um, so I think I think we we were we were having a lot of fun with some of those um, those tropes and those those cliched notions. Um, Cam, uh, the the uh, feminist uh, aspect oh, yeah. was in the very beginning. I mean, we rolled up female characters, yeah, and they were not seen as somehow intruding or not having a place to play it was all uh, equal across the board and no there was no uh, second glance at a female military officer uh, it's just right from the very beginning and we, we didn't even question that it was just a foundational assumption sure. uh, in in the gaming and uh, and it carried on i don't know why but it just it was right there at the very beginning yeah, yeah. it's not something you talked through you just did no. it yeah, yeah just, just did it um if you want to if you want to you know a fully balanced fully realized world then everybody in it has to be fully realized and, and you know and have value in and of themselves mm -hmm. um and you just go from there and uh, it, it would have felt very strange you know rolling up nothing but male characters it, it, it doesn't make any sense um so yeah um yeah, I don't. I don't know if we ever talked about it, Cam. In terms of, you know, um... my my memory is that we never actually talked about it. It was just a, a found a, an assumption. That, yeah. Uh, right at the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, and it didn't really occur to me as something that was strange. No, no. In if fact, you look at the yeah. larger body of fantasy. I mean, the you know different attitudes prevail. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe yeah. not so much anymore, but uh, maybe because yeah. we're sensitive new age guys. <laughs> well, to be honest, it's when you think about it in terms of gaming and you go, well, I, I'm going to play a female character and you go, but you don't want to subject the female character to the treatment a, a, a woman would get, say, in a lot of the other fantasy worlds where they are not the hero of their own story because you want to game them as the hero of their own story. So if you have that mindset from the very beginning, you suddenly see it's this is the character and that's the first and foremost thing. And then you think in terms of, well, are they male? Or are they female? But uh, I, I think we see that in a lot of the constructions in uh, older fantasy novels. And, and it is a, a change that has come in and is something that's great about the modern genre is it we're no longer in that uh, setup where women are seen as paraphernalia for the male hero or in serving the male hero's story. Because from a gaming perspective, you want to play a really cool character. 
So with I think with that mindset from the very beginning, that it gives you a leg up on, on trying to create good or interesting characters and then thinking about them in, in terms of uh, gender and sexuality and all of these sorts of things as after the fact as what you're building into the character, but you start with the premise of this is going to be an interesting character that is going to be central to their own story. Yeah, yeah we've come a long way from The Hobbit where there's not a single female character to be mm. seen anywhere. <laughs> the genre's changed a lot since then, but I do think you guys were probably outliers at the time that you were you were gaming all this and, and writing all this, but the genre has definitely uh, changed. Well, my, my first three characters I ever rolled up were all as a group, Adamander, Rake, Kaladin Brood, and Triss, who became the Queen of Dreams. Um, yeah. So those are my first, you know, my first experience uh, in a gaming setting. Um, and, you know, when, when, when the fights happened, um, they all played a role. And so it just seemed, you know, fairly, fairly obvious. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, uh, in terms of outliers. I mean, we, we were, Cam, I mean, we were consciously rejecting uh, the Eurocentric medieval fantasy settings, which, you know, has implicitly has patriarchy as, as its, you know, central tenet. So we were making a conscious effort to to break out of that. We were also looking to models of um, pre-contact societies, yeah, where they're which are which are much more egalitarian. Mm. Uh, you know, and as we're seeing more and more, as, as more evidence of that is actually coming out, um, we have uh, women hunters, uh, not just male hunters, uh, and, and uh, so these societies were much more uh, gender equal. Uh, and and that, that that was more of a, our model. <clears throat> we, so we were not looking at a classical medieval um, take on things. Yeah, yeah, quite quite gender fluid as well. Uh, North American groups, native yeah. groups. Yeah, yeah. and um, the the gods themselves um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> could appear. I mean, after all, they don't have to be limited to any one gender. They can be whatever yeah. they want. There, there's a lot of mythological basis for that as well. You see that in, in Loki, for example, who can take various forms and even give birth. Uh, and, and of course, you see it in Greek mythology as well. Uh, lots of uh, fluidity there, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, thank you very much, guys, for, for joining and, and having just, it, it was just nice to sit, instead of having an agenda for we're going to talk about this, just to sit and hang out and chat. And uh, I, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed it as much if I, as I have, because I've, I've just been really enjoying this. So Cameron, thank you so much for, for taking the time to do this. Great, thank you for the idea and, and prop proposition and uh, the invite, uh, it's great. Thank you very much. Uh, Philip, thank you. It, it once again great to see you, and I'm sure we'll be talking soon to do some more, you know, various talking about narrative as well as uh, talking about the the other various things that we ruminate upon mm -hmm. on uh, both our channels. Indeed, and I look forward to that. And it's been a pleasure chatting with uh, all three of you. So thank you, AP, for inviting me to uh, have be part of this wonderful little discussion. Um, and Steve, once again. Like you come in, you insult me, you make fun of me, but it it's always it is always so good to to chat to you. So thank you very much, and thank you for taking the time to do it. Well, you know, I I, I kind of end up feeling bad in the sense because <laughs> when Cam and I get together, um, and we start talking the games we ran, uh, I, I'm I'm worried that I'm boring boring people rigid because no, nope. it, it, it's it's like archaeologists getting together and they start talking archaeology stories and dig stories um you know other people can just sort of you know fall asleep Roll and we'll just we'll just keep going right so <laughs> with the gaming stuff it's it's quite similar so i always worry about that but oh i promise you that uh people are going to watch this video and enjoy those little anecdotes a lot uh so speaking as a fan uh, i'm pretty sure i i can speak for the rest of the fans out there all right so, cool well thank you thank you ap yeah so thank you all and for those of you still watching thank you very much for watching thank you for your continued support and we will see you in the next one